Welcome to Process Control Design and Practice. My name is Tom Meadowcroft. In this video, we will learn about cascade and split range control loops. In the last lecture, we learned that some process elements have slow dynamics. Here, a process stream feeding the flash tank T1 is heated using the steam heat exchanger E1 to drive off a low boiling component as vapor. The process objective is to maintain the composition of the bottoms product by maintaining a temperature in T1. We have one degree of freedom to manipulate the steam valve CVE1. Clearly, we need to use that degree of freedom to control TT T1, the T1 temperature. Sadly, that will be a slow loop because the thermal mass of T1 is substantial. Too bad we can't control TTE1 instead. That would be a fast loop and the resulting control performance would be much superior. But TTE1 isn't our objective. TTT1 is. And while they're dependent on each other, they're not going to be the same temperature and they're not going to change identically. Let's look at the control problem more closely. What changes would disturb T1's temperature and therefore cause the composition of the bottom product to change? Pause here and think of your answers. I can think of four changes that the controller would have to react to. The feed temperature, the feed composition, the feed flow rate, or the steam pressure. The interesting feature of each of these changes is that they would all affect both temperatures, the fast TTE1 as well as the slow TTT1. The improved solution to this problem is called a cascade control scheme. We're going to implement two controllers. First, we're going to control TTE1, the exit temperature from the heat exchanger, which will be a fast loop by manipulating the steam valve with the controller TCE1. The second loop with the slow dynamics will control TTT1 by manipulating the set point to the first controller TCE1. When T1's temperature is low, it raises the set point for TCE1. That controller will react to an increased target set point for TTE1 by manipulating our one degree of freedom, the steam valve. We're going to label TCT1 the supervisory controller because it is giving commands to TCE1, which we will call the subordinate controller. In a cascade steam, the subordinate controller is always the fast loop and always manipulates the degree of freedom. The output of the supervisory controller always manipulates the set point of the subordinate controller, which we label RSP for remote set point. Note, we have not created an extra degree of freedom here, and we're still only satisfying one objective and manipulating one valve. But a cascade control scheme has multiple advantages. First of all, all of the disturbances that we listed affecting TTT1 will affect TTE1 as well, but they affect the subordinate temperature much faster and the fast subordinate controller will adjust to reject those disturbances on the secondary objective with little or no effect on the primary objective. Next, the subordinate controller can be operated in cascade or remote set point mode as drawn, or it can be switched to local mode where it ignores the supervisory controller. Now, why would we allow this act of rebellion against the supervisor? Well, when T1 is starting up and empty, it would be better to run in local mode, that is just controlling the exit temperature of the heat exchanger and ignoring the T1 temperature until T1 fills and heats up. 
because otherwise the supervisory controller might call for too much heat early on, overheating the fluid or causing an overshoot in the temperature. Local control would also allow temporary operation if TT T1 malfunctioned. At this point, let's introduce the function block diagram or FBD. FBDs represent the elements of a control loop such as sensors, valves, and controllers with rectangles called function blocks. Each function block exists in the control system and each carries out one task. Inputs to a function block are on the left and outputs are on the right. The lines connecting the blocks represent signals, which we often label with their units. FBDs are a useful visual tool and continuous controls on most programmable logic controllers or distributed control systems are configured using interactive FBD displays. So you'll see FBDs in the workplace. Here on the left, we see the temperature transmitter TTT1 converting a raw signal from a sensor to a signal in degree C. That signal becomes the process variable, or PV, of the controller TCE1, which also receives a local set point. The controller's output of 0 to 100% goes to the function block for CVE1, which converts it to an electrical signal to the valve. This is our subordinate loop. When we bring in the components of the supervisory loop, we have another sensor input, TTT1, and another controller, TCT1. The output of the supervisory controller, TCT1, becomes the remote set point for the subordinate controller, TCE1, just as we did when we were diagramming this as a PNID. And on TCE1, there's now another input for that controller, which allows it to be toggled between local mode, L, where it ignores the supervisor, and remote or cascade mode, R. Boolean toggle just means one or zero, on or off. We'll be using the FBD often. See more examples in the text. Also in the text, See another good cascade design example for reflux control of a distillation column? Do the cascade exercises at the end of the chapter to get used to this commonly used technique. A brief note on terminology. From the point they were introduced until recently, the two cascaded loops were referred to as the master and slave loops. Now, do we really need or want to reference human bondage to convey the meaning intended? Uh, clearly, no. Uh, a lot of other sources currently use the labels primary loop and secondary loop, but I can never remember which is which. Supervisory and subordinate is my preferred terminology because it describes the design clearly and because I made it up. Uh, be warned that you'll see other terms in other places. Our second topic in this video is split range control. Split range control is necessary when we need more than one valve to control one degree of freedom. Now, why would we need that? Well, largely these applications fall into two groups, uh, both of which are quite common. The first is where we need two different size control valves to operate at two different operating points. Control valves are sized based on a flow rate and a pressure drop due to fluid properties. And when the process, often a batch process, needs a flow to be controlled over a wide range of flows or properties, one valve can't satisfy the whole operating range. So we install two valves in parallel, one big, one small. The second case is when we have a design where one process stream needs to be heated in one set of conditions and cooled in another. So the stream is put through two heat exchangers, one for cooling, one for heating, each with its own control valve on the 
two utility flows, the hot flow and the cold flow. Here we see an example of the first. C1 is a batch column that operates under vacuum. The small valve, CVC1A, is used to control pressure close to atmospheric, but as the pressure decreases and the vapor density falls, CVC1A is no longer big enough and the larger CVC1B is needed to control pressure. We need to convert the output of the controller, PCC1, to appropriate signals for the two valves as shown in this graph. The x-axis is the controller output and the y-axis is the signals to the two valves. In blue, we see the small A valve open from 0 to 100% as the controller output ranges from 0 to 50%. Above a controller output of 50%, CVC1A is wide open, and CVC1B in red starts to open from 0 to 100% as the controller output increases from 50 to 100%. The function block diagram for this solution needs a new type of function block, one that does math. The output from PCC1 goes to two math blocks one that describes the transformation for the blue line on the graph for CVC1A, and one that describes the transformation for the red line for CVC1B. See the text for more detail and more examples. Be sure to do the exercise that asks you to design a split range controller for an example with heating and cooling of one stream. Today we learned how to design cascade and split range feedback controllers. The cascade control scheme allows us to incorporate a subordinate fast loop to achieve better control of the slow supervisory loop. The split range controller allows us to implement feedback when we need two or more valves to control one degree of freedom over a range of conditions. Finally, we learned how to draw a function block diagram to describe different continuous control schemes. Look for a full text, exercises, and more videos at chemicalengineeringpractice.org. I'm Tom Meadowcroft. I hope to see you again soon.